Jensen, it's our postdoc researcher uh, here and he's working on a, I believe, interesting project, uh, uh, FP7 project, uh, uh, more research focused one, where uh, called Sunseed and he's going to talk about experiences and research that we are doing over there. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Shichela. Yes, um, so this talk, as uh, Chela mentioned, uh, will be focusing on this uh, Sunseed project. Um, and the, the agenda for today, the, the topics I will go through, will uh, start uh, with, I will um, try to give an introduction to the, to the use cases that we are considering in the, in the Sunseed project. Uh, so briefly outlining what are the main research problems we are facing. Uh, and one part there is to, uh, to enable better observability in the distribution grid. And uh, in that part I will then go into what, what is the, what we call a WAMPS node. And then um, the next question is how can telecom uh, networks uh, or cellular networks support WAMPS nodes? Um, this part will probably be a bit related to what uh, Herman presented before, but I will try to, to, to shift the focus a, a bit on that part. Uh, then there will be a, a short five minutes break just to, uh, to get you uh, up a little bit. And then um, the last part of the presentation will be about um, different things that are necessary to, to run the distribution grid closer to its limits and I will explain what I mean by that. So one part is secure and ultra-reliable communications and the second part is about data and analytics and visualization in, and then exams from some team project. But before I start I'll just uh, explain a little bit about the Sunseed project. So there are nine partners from uh, six countries. Um, we have uh, Gemalto from France and Germany, and we have Toshiba Research from the United Kingdom. Um, then we have, of course, Oba University from Denmark, Institute uh, Josef Stefan from Slovenia, and TNO from the Netherlands. So these are research institutions. And then finally we have yeah, one you can say a cornerstone in the project are these uh, three companies, Telecom Slovenia, Electro Primorska and Electro Servici. And they are from uh, Slovenia and, and basically they have a, a collaboration, meaning that uh, or they have overlapping service areas. So we have uh, telecom communication networks and uh, distribution grid in the same uh, physical location, so by these two companies. Um, and then this company uh, is certifying and producing uh, smart meters um, or testing smart meters. So it, there is a, a unique opportunity in this project uh, to, uh, to try out some things in the, in the field. And this is also a, yeah, what, what will be done uh, in the project. Uh, right now we are yeah, a, a bit more than one year into the project and we just had our first uh, review in, in Brussels. Um, so, so now we are, we are really starting to, to put together this, uh, this field trial. Uh, I will not focus so much on the field trial today, but more on, uh, on the research problems in, in the project. So, to explain the first, uh, or the use cases in the project, we, have, we are using this uh, figure. So basically we have uh, a traditional power grid. So in the upper left corner we have a, a main distribution uh, station, and uh, then we have some transformer stations, and you can see in that one up there you have a, a wind turbine, and down here uh, you have some consumers, some households. <coughs> um, the thing is that the distribution company are actually blind in this lower part of, of the distribution grid. Of course there are smart meters that are um, measuring the consumption and reporting that, but it's, it's uh, on an hourly or per day basis. 
So there's no uh, real-time information on what is actually going on in the grid uh, on that level. Um, so here the distribution companies, they are they're exploiting that the sum of the consumption of all the yeah, households is somewhat predictable so they know how much uh, power to produce. Um, yeah, but yeah, maybe this is today or, or you could say yesterday where, where we just had consumers, we didn't have any uh, distributed uh, production. But tomorrow, when uh, or, yeah, we have already started today, you could say we, we also have uh, solar panels <coughs> on many houses, at least in Denmark, we, uh, there are quite a few households that, uh, that have uh, PV panels now. Uh, we, we have an increasing amount of uh, wind turbines um, and, and some people are also starting to get these uh, electric vehicles. Um, this means that we are introducing some, uh, some variability or some uncertainty into the distribution grid um, because, well, the solar panels will produce power when the sun is shining. Uh, we don't always know when that happens. Uh, People will plug in their electric vehicle to charge it when they return from home or uh, when they return from visiting someone. So, and then suddenly there's a big load uh, on the on the on the grid. If if we are lucky, then maybe they will uh, plug in their vehicle when the sun is also shining and will not draw draw so much power from the grid. But if there is this. Uh, we could say variability and, and uncertainty. Um, if we are not able to measure anything uh, in in real time from the consumer or prosumer level, so what we are proposing in the Sunset project is to uh, add these so-called uh, WAPS nodes, so these uh, uh, purplish uh, squares. So we add those to some selected prosumers. And, and maybe also in some uh, transformer stations and these WAMP nodes are then able to <coughs> give us measurements in, in real time uh, I will yeah, get to shortly what is actually the, a WAMP node but it's a device that's able to give uh, near real or real time measurements so what we need in, uh, for this first use case is to uh, yeah we need to add some some of these uh, monitoring devices these swamp nodes uh, to some selected consumer locations and what uh, will we have this thumb rule that probably it will be around 15 percent of uh, consumers where we need to put this uh, device then we uh, we need to have uh, smart meters that report in near real time so so maybe it would be it would be useful to have uh, on a minute scale so so sub hour uh, reporting intervals and uh, and of course to have communication to and from these WAMS nodes we need some kind of uh, real time communication networks as well um, another challenge uh, that we have that was not visible in this figure uh, before um, is that yeah let me let me start uh, say that that in traditional or conventional power systems we have uh, three different types of, uh, of power grids so the typical one is this uh, radial um, so the leftmost one where we have a generator and then we have like a bus structure where we have the loads on. Uh, and that could be household, for, for instance. This is very simple, but it's uh, not very reliable because we don't have any redundancy. Um, then if you need something that is more reliable, you can have a loop system. So if you have two generators, then you can switch between which one supplies power to, uh, to the loads. So you have some kind of redundancy. And then finally we have what we call uh, the network type. Um, where we can connect different generators uh, in some uh, more advanced way. Um, so this is very well for uh, conventional power systems where you just have generators and then a flow of 
power down to the loads. But when we start to introduce um, yeah, distributed energy resources, so solar panels and electric vehicles, then suddenly you have a mix-up between generators and, uh, and loads, and sometimes they change roles as well for the electric vehicle. So, so <coughs> things become much more fuzzy in that case. Um, of course, you, you can have a, a much shorter producer-consumer distance, uh, which is maybe a good thing, but it's also ne ne necessary to rethink the, the protection, and also you have to start thinking about more distributed principles in the in the grid management. Um, so this is an additional challenge, challenge that should also be taken into account. Um, so the second use case in the in the Sunset project um, is about. Uh, introducing some advanced management principles. Um, so, if we start again from the case where we do not have uh, WAMS nodes, we do not have uh, good observability in the, in the bottom part of, of the grid, uh, but we assume that we have some uh, consumers uh, here, so we have some uh, households with, with electric vehicles and we have some solar panels. Um, then in the case where we would like to add a new consumer here, um, then what uh, the distribution company would, uh, would say is, okay, since we, we, we don't have any observability in this part of the grid, so we have to dimension or manage uh, the grid um, based on the worst case. So uh, unfortunately we are not able to connect this new consumer to this point because then in some cases we, we could potentially uh, have a, a voltage uh, violation uh, so therefore we have to connect him all the way over here to the, the big transformer station and, uh, and this is uh, yeah, also on this figure it's a much longer distance so it's much more expensive to, to uh, dig the cables um, Another th thing could be uh, this, we want to add a new wind turbine um, and again if we are dimensioning after the worst case principles then we cannot connect it here but we have to connect it to another uh, transform station which may be also located further away so, so there would be some extra expenses uh, in that um, but then if we add more observability by these uh, WAMS nodes and we have some control uh, in the system then um, we would actually be able to connect this uh, new consumer um, here so we would not have to connect them all the way over here but since we have some means of controlling and making sure that we are not that we do not get budget uh, violations uh, then we can um, operate the grid closer to the limit but without exceeding the, uh, the limit so, so we don't have to uh, dimension after the, the worst case situation um, so in this case it's uh, yeah we, we, we need to have some kind of uh, demand response or, or control um, possibilities in the grid so the things we need in this case uh, to, to realize this use case is we need again the WAMS nodes, we need some reliable and low latency communication, uh, then we need to have some, some knowledge about the grid and what are the entities in the grid, so if we have uh, electric vehicles, solar panels and, and so on. And then we need to be able to, uh, to forecast uh, the demand and maybe also the load. Uh, and finally, to control uh, some of these aspects, we, we need to be to have some yeah, remote control of uh, of the electric electricity resources, but maybe also appliances and, and storage uh, entities in in the grid. Then we have the third use case, which I will skip over quite fast because 
I will not uh, talk much about it in the rest of the presentation, but just for completeness, I, I, will, uh, I will give you a brief intro. So the idea is that, um, that we can actually do some advanced uh, fault management. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction of the Sunsea project, we have this, uh, this joint uh, area, uh, overlapping um, areas of where we have the telecom and we have the distribution company. So we are trying to exploit the fact that we can get information about the power grid from both of these sources. So, um, so we want to combine what we have he here, which is the, you would say, the telecom view. So uh, let's say that all the households that have some uh, broadband uh, wire, broadband connection, so they have some ADSL modem, for instance, that are connected um, to to the to the telecom modem management system uh, up there. So uh, so then, if if we had a power outage in some neighborhoods, then maybe uh, this modem management uh, system is no longer able to uh, to co contact the modems, or maybe they can sense that there's, there's a power outage and then they send a, an alarm. So uh, in, in just before the they shut down due to missing power, and then on the other side from the distribution company, we have the the smart meters, where they could also, when they uh, notice that there is no uh, that there is a power outage or some event in the power grid, they could send via the cellular networks some kind of alarm or dying gas message saying now we have a power outage or whatever it is. Um, so we have these two different types of uh, say signals and information about uh, events in the power grid and by combining those you have a more rich image of what is actually going on in, uh, in the grid. Yeah. Um, I'll skip to this one. So this uh, is a slightly different view of, uh, of the use cases in the Sunsea project. Uh, to, you can actually look at it as a, some kind of control and measurement loop. Uh, so the inner, the red loop, is uh, one example of uh, if we have a, a, this uh, volt bar controller. Um, so where we, first we measure from the wax nodes up here. And then through the telecom network plus maybe the DSO network, um, we feed that into what we call integrated control management and analytics. Um, <clears throat> so this is where we have state estimation and uh, forecasting functions. Then this goes into some controller algorithm. And then again, we need to uh, send these control signals through the telecom or DSO networks. Um, and then we have some voltage regulation. We have WAMP nodes that are actually not only measurement nodes, as <coughs> I have talked about them until now, but they, they can also uh, be in charge of uh, controlling appliances in the household. So, um, so time shifting, uh, washing machines, or, or something like that. Um, yeah, and then we close the loop back again to the, the measurement phase. So that's uh, one part. Then we have um, yeah, presumer demand response. So we have a, a similar loop out here where then um, yeah, we have some demand supply controller, we have some forecasting also, and then um, we have in, in addition to the, the WAMP node measurements, we also have uh, smart meter uh, measurements we take into account. Um, the idea here is that the inner loop is, uh, is much faster uh, than the outer loop, so it's different uh, time scales. Yeah, just to, to summarize uh, a little bit the, the use cases, so the the first one is about a, a dense network of measurement nodes, so smart meters and WAMS nodes, um, that are 
work on uh, selected prosumer locations to en enhance the observability. Then we have uh, the second use case, so real-time synchronized measurements, and we want to uh, to have some advanced distribution management system. So those are the, the, the key points to, to remember. So that was uh, the introduction about the use cases in uh, in, uh, in the Sunsea project. And now I will talk about how we can actually enable uh, observability in the, in the distribution grid. So this WAM nodes that I talked about, what is it actually? Um, it is, you could say, it's a, it's a kind of device that lies in between uh, a traditional uh, smart meter and then uh, what is called a phase of measurement unit. So the phase of measurement unit is something that has so far uh, only been used in, uh, in the transmission grid. So it's a device that's able to um, to measure um, electrical wa waveforms um, and they're represented as, uh, as phases uh, using a common um, time source, so that could be a GPS uh, receiver or maybe uh, NCP, so the network time protocol. Um, and they measure voltage and current, and then you can see the frequency deviation, so if there's a phase offset, uh, both relatively for the voltage and current, and also in relation to a, a reference measurement at a transformer level, for instance. Um, and, and yeah, the way it works is a diagram here. So we have some analog inputs um, for the different uh, phases. Then we have some analog to digital conversion. We have a phase lock uh, oscillator, and, and we have this GPS receiver that has a time reference. And then what we get out is uh, this phase of representation of, uh, of the. Yeah, the, the waveforms uh, that are measured um, and then yeah, we, we, we communicate these uh, phases um, yeah, to some uh, say measurement collection uh, database. In the transmission grid this happened, uh, these measurements are taken with a, a very high frequency so up to I think 100 hertz. Uh, mess or no, the measurements are actually uh, done faster uh, over here, but the, the, the reports are being sent uh, 100 times or 50, 100 times per second. Um, and when you when you have this kind of information, then it actually allows us to run the, the power lines closer to the dynamic limit and, and not just according to the to the worst case. Um, so all this was, was was general also for this phase measurement unit. What we want to do is to take basically this functionality and put it into uh, what we call the uh, WAMS node and then put this into the distribution grid. Um, the, the PMUs, the, the phase measurement units are, are very expensive since they are in the high and medium voltage grid, but we want to put them into the low voltage grid. Uh, so, so it's actually possible to, to make some relatively cheap devices uh, and, and this also enables that we can uh, install them in, in many households. So it, according to, to our, our knowledge, we, we, we don't know of such WAMPs type of devices uh, yet in the market. Um, yeah. But we, of course we have the similar ones in the transmission grid that are very expensive. Um, so the way that we are, you would say, well, th these devices are being designed in the project and we are want to manufacture, I think it's uh, around 250 devices and they are based on, uh, on this uh, Intel Edison platform. So we have a, a yeah, communication and processing um, board which is then connected to, uh, to a, another board uh, which is uh, the measurement module uh, 
Um, yeah, you can see the interface to watch is AMC, advanced speed and, and control. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of different uh, connection possibilities, um, but I'll not go too much into details with this. But I can mention that uh, this Mobile World Congress that was being held in Barcelona in, in the beginning of March, we actually uh, were lucky enough to participate and we had a, a prototype of this, uh, of this board uh, being presented. Um, in that case, it was actually this uh, EU ICC, which is uh, basically an, an embedded SIM card in the in the WAMS node that uh, that, actually, that was uh, you say the, the key point at, at, on the mobile world congress. Uh, I'll get back to this, but basically we are able to to also ensure an end-to-end -end security uh, or secure connection from these WAMS nodes. Um, so that we have secure communication, um, and I will get back to that in the, in the end of my presentation. So, uh, when we have these WAMS nodes, um, we would we would like to yeah be able to collect these measurements via some uh, network connection, and since this has to uh, happen quite fast in order to have uh, control. Um, then we, uh, yeah, in, in this part of the presentation, I will then uh, present the results. I, I think Haman also presented this, but uh, I will uh, try to focus on some different parts. So, just to recap. So, what we wanted to do was to introduce these wire stoves in some different uh, consumers. Um, and specifically, we wanted to look into how uh, LTE can support the WAMS nodes. Yeah. So we we uh, we are considering how to improve the observability, both using traditional smart meters, but especially also these uh, WAMS nodes, or as we we have also called them, extended smart meters. Um, so in the Sunseed project they are called WAMS nodes and, uh, and we use the more general term, uh, this extended smart meters. Um, so in, the, in this study, I guess Haman uh, already told you some of this, but just to summarize, what we did was we, uh, we tried to characterize uh, the traffic uh, going to and from the traditional smart meter and, and there we used this open smart grid, um, so network system requirement specification as a, as a starting point and we made some assumptions on different uh, system events and then we were able to extract a, a traffic model and, and here we, we have some of the, the data amounts and as you can as summarize up there we have uh, an uplink traffic is only 0 0.4 bytes per second and downlink Downing 0.5 bytes per second uh, between a, a, or to and from a, a single smart meter. Um, but if we talk about the wax nodes of these extended smart meters, um, then then we actually have 10,000 times more data. So the way we achieved or uh, ended up with this number was to um, yeah we took a starting point in these trans transmission grid PMU standards. Uh, IEEE C 37118 and this IEC 68150, uh, where there is a frame format defined for uh, PMU measurements. But this is for the, the transmission grid, we should uh, keep in mind. And, and these frames are actually sent over, uh, over fiber connections. Um, but the fact is, uh, we don't have distribution grid uh, WAMS nodes, so, so we, we didn't know exactly how, how we should pack the data. Uh, so we decided to, to uh, actually reuse this frame format and then concatenate uh, 50 measurements per second, so assuming a 50 hertz uh, sampling rate, and then send that over the LTE network. This was a problem 
perhaps a, a very rough or crude assumption. Um, and, and we will also investigate in the project if something else makes more sense. But for this initial study, we, we just decided to do this. Um, and that's how we ended up with this uh, quite big uh, data amount. One thing to, to uh, keep in mind is, of course, that this frame format is actually is, is quite compact. So, uh, uh, in that sense, maybe uh, maybe it's not too too unrealistic. So, this slide this slide is about the, the yeah, communication architectures. Uh, relating a little bit to the comment uh, you had before to Kamal's presentation about uh, why we didn't consider PLC um, networks or, or for connecting the smart meters. And it's true that uh, it's often used. Um, here's one example of a, a building complex where all the smart meters are connected to power line communications then to a, a, a small substation and then there is a mobile network GPS connection to, uh, to send up all the data from, from this, or usually it's called a concentrator. Um, the thing is that for, for the WAMP nodes, this is probably not possible, uh, in, at least not in all cases, because sometimes you have some, uh, some multi-hub chain topologies. So to, call, or to communicate with the PLC <coughs> You have to go over multiple hubs, and, and there can be tens of seconds of, uh, of delay. Um, you could all, of course, it would also be possible to use uh, wireless med mesh networks, as uh, the Danish company Kamstrup is doing, and yeah, uh, I mentioned several technologies, but also this Zigbee uh, is one option, or as. Uh, Alianda and uh, KPN are doing in the Netherlands. They have their own private cellular network called CDMA 450. So it's operated at 450 uh, megahertz. Um, but the, yeah, a reason for, for using the public LTE network is basically in the interest of the partners in this project uh, to investigate is it feasible to use Telecom Slovenia's networks to uh, to you would say complement the, the DSO networks and, and also collect, collect the data. Yeah. I guess maybe Herman has also talked about this, but uh, we focused on GSM and, and uh, LTE because GSM, GPRS is, uh, is the most, most widespread used. Uh, and LCE because for the WAMS node we can see that the, the bandwidth is so large we need something very high performing. Um, so the simulation results, we have two uh, sets of results. Um, the first one here is about uh, smart meters on GPRS. So how well can we support uh, smart meter traffic? Um, we it's not just uh, the smart meter traffic that I showed before where we had around 0 0.5 bytes per second in each direction, but uh, here we want to see how, how far can we uh, increase the report uh, frequency or the decrease the report interval. Um, how, how, uh, how low can we go before the, the GPS network cannot uh, support the smart meters anymore? And actually what we find is that for, if we go down to one minute <coughs> report intervals, then we can support up to 1500 smart meters. And if we can sell with five minute uh, report intervals, then we can go up to 6000 uh, smart meters. So we can actually get some, uh, some quite frequent updates. Um, and this is for the case where, <clears throat> where we're using a, a single carrier in GPRS <clears throat> and it, it is possible to use multiple carriers so in, in that sense you could uh, increase the, the capacity or decrease uh, the, report, uh, the report interval 
if you use two carriers, then probably you could go to around 3,000 uh, smart meters. Okay. And then for the results on the WAMS nodes using LTE networks, um, so yeah, it, it's only the solid lines that are actually uh, interesting in these uh, plots because those are the you could say realistic results. Uh, I guess I might explain what was the difference. Uh, but um, the important thing here is that with with LTE, in, if we are using 10 megahertz configuration, then we can support uh, up to 20% of ha households uh, um, having WAMS nodes. If we say that we have 4,500 devices in a cell, um, if we are using this LTE uh, M configuration where we only have 1.4 megahertz uh, bandwidth, uh, then we can we can hardly support uh, anything. I think that's uh, that's a black line here. So then it's only two percent. Um, but what we can do is, if we're able to somehow uh, you condense the payload size, so use compression, or um, if it's not necessary to have fifty samples every second, uh, then. Then we can actually uh, also with the LCE M configuration be able to to support uh, more than twenty percent uh, of households with uh, with wine stumps. Yeah. So uh, so what we did in this study was to increase the uh, reporting frequency of smart meters. We we have also considered what if we deployed uh, WAMS nodes. Um, yeah, and GPS we can support down to five minute report intervals, and we can also support uh, WAMS nodes in in the distribution grid for the T. But we should consider using smaller uh, report sizes. Um, so this part will be about uh, running the smart grid closer to its limits. Um, In order to do that, uh, we have identified that we need uh, secure and much reliable communications and data analytics and visualization, or mostly data analytics actually. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> in Sunseed, or whenever you have a, a telecom and you have a distribution company, then, um, then there are different uh, communication options. And here is a, a table of um, yeah, different uh, alternative, um, alternative communication configurations, you would say. So, the way to read this is... Let me see if I can point here. So, um, let's say that we want to have a primary connection and a backup connection, so called secondary. Uh, then. One option could be to have uh, a fiber connection from the utility company as the primary and then a fiber connection from the telecom as the secondary. <coughs> or it could be to have fiber from the utility and uh, LTE from the telecom. So the, that could be used as uh, yeah, primary and, and backup, so maybe from, uh, using some kind of payload solution. Uh, and there are some different uh, configurations that are are considered in the Sunseed project. Um, a different view on this uh, is shown here where we have some uh, yeah, different deployment options. Um, so basically we have the Telecom <coughs> core network over here um, and we have the DSO uh, management center here and we have some uh, Sunsea data databases uh, in this box here. So basically, what we need to do when we have a WAMS node, WAMS nodes that are doing measurements or, or smart meters, then we need to communicate from the left side over here from these devices, and then through either the mobile network 
for the wired network through the silicon core network and then to yeah, maybe the DSO management center or, or with this uh, database uh, center. Um, what is important to notice here is that we, we actually have two um, independent ways into the telecom core network. So if we are using the, the mobile network, we go this way, uh, we are going via the yeah, base stations and the uh, edge routers here into the core network. And if we are using a wired connection, so DSL or fiber to the home, um, then we are coming this way into the telecom network. Of course, in this picture, we haven't even shown uh, necessarily the, or the PLC uh, communication uh, is also uh, independent some of the way. Of course, if, it, if it's connecting via GPRS or another cellular technology, then it would enter somewhere uh, in the mobile network. Um, yes. So, so what's important to notice here is that we have two independent uh, entrances into the uh, telecom network. Um, from Telecom Slovenia, so the Telecom in Sunsi, we have these uh, examples uh, of measurements on uh, the availability of fiber, wireline services and availability of mobile base stations. Um, so on the, the lower figure here, you have the green ones that are GSM base stations and the blue ones are LTE base stations. And as you can see here, then at some point, I guess they, they turned on their LTE base stations, they, they deployed them. And before that point in time, they probably didn't have LTE coverage. Um, and then we have the availability over here. So 100% uh, and here 99.8. And then we have different weeks <coughs> all the time. Uh, and the upper figure, we also have the weeks and availability. Um, but here is for yeah, just best effort internet and VPN services. So um, yeah, VPN services is for secure communication. Um, and what we can see is that the Y line, we have 99.98% uh, availability, which corresponds to uh, two minutes of downtime per week or 1.7 hour per year downtime, on average. For the mobile, uh, for a mobile base station, the average is 20 minutes per week or 17 hours per year uh, downtime. Um, so the thing is here that you can see up uh, the top one even for the, the wireline services 99.9 9 is not a very large availability number or reliability number. Uh, usually we are talking about uh, four or five nines and it's, uh, it's not so close to that. Um, so well, one of the ideas in the Sunset project is, uh, is to uh, try and achieve higher uh, reliability so for instance, we, we could have some certain uh, alarms or control messages where we need uh, fine lines, so 99.999% reliability. Um, and we don't have that with the curve, with the, the networks uh, independently or just a single network. But if we could uh, combine the best uh, of the two, if we can assume that they are actually independent, then we can use this equation uh, from yeah, series and par parallel system theory, and uh, and then in principle we should be able to get six lines of uh, reliability um, if if we can justifiably assume that the networks are, are independent, um, the LC and the fiber networks. And uh, 
I think there is at least outside the core you you can with some uh, yeah it, it can be justified that uh, that we can say that they are independent. I tried to make this table uh, trying to consider different types of uh, uh, if you say outages or, or errors. So if the house power uh, goes, then of course that would affect the PLC, uh, the cable, internet, the DSL, the fiber to the home. But probably the, the cellular networks would not be affected if it was base station outage then that would only affect the cellular uh, technologies if uh, I guess cables in the road if, if, uh, if the municipality is uh, digging in the, in the, under the sidewalk and then they uh, accidentally break a cable then this would not um, affect the cellular networks but, but perhaps the DSL or fiber to the home would, uh, would be affected. Um, so it seems that uh, that depending on the errors then it's uh, one of the other type that is, uh, that is affected. So um, yeah. So in, in the smart grid we, uh, we have very diverse uh, requirements to the to latency and, and reliability. So reliability is uh, the probability that uh, that service is delivered for some amount of time. So basically, that uh, we can in communications we can say that the probability that we can get a message through before a certain latency deadline. Um, and just from this open smart grid. Uh, specifications which I mentioned before. There are actually examples of uh, one type of measurements, this uh, periodic meter reading. There you have uh, something like 99% reliability, but you just need to have that within a 24 hours window. Uh, so, so you need to have measurements connected in 99% of uh, cases. Uh, but just within 24 hours, it's, it's something like that, and, and that gives you quite a lot of time to ensure that you that you get the measurements. But contrary, or a completely different type of requirement <coughs> is, um, for instance, uh, this uh, real time pricing uh, to and from a smart meter. In that case, you have uh, only a five seconds uh, deadline. And, and then maybe you, it, it's of 95%. So in that case, uh, the, the time uh, is a completely different scale. So I, I forgot to mention this figure up here is uh, is a graphical representation of the of the um, communication requirements for the different uh, smart meter use cases. So um, I tried to plot what is uh, the maximum latency for the the, uh, the different, you could say, packets of messages in uh, in the different use cases, and then what are also the the payload sizes for for the use cases. So um, so for instance, this meter event, <coughs> let's say, then then you have a, a maximum latency between. Uh, 30 and 60 seconds, or from yeah, between uh, 30 and 60 seconds, and the payload size is between 150 and 300 uh, bytes. And um, yeah, so just from looking at how how these different use cases are spread uh, in the figure, you can see that the, the requirements are quite diverse. Um, but coming back to this uh, example of 24 hours, in that case, um, even though you could use, uh, let's say you used uh, two communication paths, you both uh, used uh, a, a wire uh, technology, 
and at the same time you send the same information on, on a wireless technology over the cellular network, uh, then you would be able to get this six nines uh, reliability. But if you have 24 hours to, to make sure that the data gets through, then, then maybe you can, you can try to send it and then two hours later you can try to send it again if, if you didn't get an acknowledgement. So, so perhaps this kind of uh, multi-interface transmission <coughs> only makes sense for, for certain types of traffic. Um, also, the cellular networks, we, we don't have unlimited uh, bandwidth, uh, so, so we want to, uh, to use it uh, sparingly. Um, so what, what we are trying to do in, in Sunsea is to, uh, to have some, you could say, uh, adaptive uh, multi-interface transmission, or maybe not adaptive, but uh, se selective uh, interface transmission, so, so that we are able to uh, identify different types of traffic and then apply uh, a transmit uh, method or strategy according to what are the, the latency requirements and reliability requirements. Uh, so for, for different applications, as I've tried to outline down here, uh, one application, uh, the communication maybe just goes via the, the DSL connection, one goes via PLC, or yeah. now I don't have fiber here, but that could also be an option. Then in other cases, uh, some messages could be sent via LTE and the DSL um, to ensure a high reliability. Um, and um, so this could also be illustrated with this figure. I, I don't know if Petra showed you this this morning, but the idea is you, you have the full set of um, messages or packets that a uh, certain uh, application could uh, could be transmitting. So the, the full configuration, maybe you only need to have 97% reliability, then you could have a, an enhanced mode or uh, something a little bit limited, which uh, you, where you could obtain 99% reliability. And then this called basic mode could be just a very necessary messages um, to, to have some functionality working but without all the advanced functions uh, and, and maybe we could ensure 99.999% reliability in that case and so, so if for, for the uh, messages falling into this group then maybe it would make sense to always use multiple interfaces for, for for that communication, so we ensure that we have a high reliability. And for other types of less important traffic, we could just use a single uh, single technology um, and then just hope that in the long run we uh, we achieve this uh, this probability, or we could have retransmissions uh, if necessary. Then we, uh, in the Sunset project, I mentioned we had this uh, embedded SIM um, in the in the WAMS node. Um, so the idea is that we want to ensure end-to-end -end security. Uh, let me say this is uh, not my area of expertise, but uh, so I'll just try to give you uh, just a small glimpse of what it is we're trying to do. <coughs> so the, the idea is that in traditional systems, uh, when we have security, then we will have a client and a server, and then an application down here. So the application will talk to the server, and the client will talk to the server. But the security would only be established between uh, the client and the server. That would be one secure connection, and then maybe there would also be a secure connection between the server and the application. <clears throat> but but usually there's no uh, no security uh, solution going the whole way from the client to the application. So 
so that you really have uh, um, strong security the whole way. In the, in the Sunseed project, we will uh, embed these uh, SIM cards. So basically, it's like the SIM card you have in your mobile phone, and then this is being uh, soldered onto the, um, the PCB of the smart meters of web devices and uh, web stores, um, meaning that you have a unique identifier for, for each device. Um, and if you try to unsolder this or tamper with the, the SIM card, then, then it will uh, somehow destroy itself. So, so in, in this way, you have a very uh, have a very good level of control with that this WAMS device is actually who he claims to be. Uh, so when the DSO mounts a, a WAMS node somewhere, then they they know when the data comes in that it's actually from from this WAMS device that uh, then they install themselves. Um, then we have. On the other side, we have the applications. So the, there is, um, so in the whole system, there is an end to end platform, and an authorization server, and a secure elements management platform. So the, the embedded SIM, uh, we also call that a secure element. Um, so basically, this whole approach ensures that um, only the people that have the, the right to, to uh, get the measurements from from the WAMS node will, can, can get those, but also that uh, that they know that when they get the measurements, it's actually from, from those WAMS nodes. Um, yeah. uh, I think I already mentioned this actually. So, let me skip. So the, the last part of this presentation is about data analytics in the, in the Sunseed project. So, um, so some of the work that has already been done is um, an initial grid topology analysis on, the, on a, an area called uh, Chromeback. Um, so there is a, I guess there is a, a power plant or a transformer station here. And there are, yeah, you can see the numbers. 216 nodes, um, and basically there was information about the nodes, buses, branches, transformers, um, and some different uh, values here. I don't know if I can probably not see it. The resolution is not high enough, or it's too too blurry. But uh, but basically the colors on the different lines show how. Um, how, how large is the load? Uh, yeah, I can't even see the numbers on my screen, but, uh, but uh, the idea is that you have some very weakly loaded uh, connections here, and up there the blue ones, then the green lines are more loaded, and then finally the red one is, is uh, most loaded. Um, but, yeah. This is just some of the, the first work that has been done. Um, then there has also been some work done on uh, initial uh, analysis analysis of uh, yeah, AMI measurements. Uh, so basically, that's measurements from smart meters, uh, advanced metering infrastructure. Um, so from some uh, some example here from a particular factory where there's up to uh, 120 kilowatt uh, peak, of peak power consumption and you can see this these different uh, peaks correspond to a day in the week so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday um, and then there are a lot of weeks overlaid on top of each other but you can see a quite consistent pattern in this and then down here is a solar plant production example uh, where luckily the curves are almost, uh, you could say, uh, within the same time span 
So actually the, the solar power can supplement uh, the consumption from the factory. But this is, uh, yeah, the, this is just measurements. Uh, what is the big research topic <laughs> in, in uh, Sunseed? Well, basically there are two things. One is uh, the state estimation, um, which uh, yeah, the concept is uh, shown on this slide. Um, so basically, the idea is we, we want to be able to estimate the, the current state of the grid and also the short-term future state of the grid. Um, now we, we only have uh, these WAMS measurements in selected locations, so def therefore we don't have exactly the, you would say, the whole uh, grid state. So therefore we, we need to be able to estimate all the missing points, what is the state. And in those locations, the approach that is taken in the project is that we have, you would say, real-time, geographically sparse WAMS node measurements, um, then we have near real-time smart meter measurements that would be down to 5 minute intervals um, as we showed in, in our study on the, on the cellular networks. Then we have some historical smart meter measurements that give us an idea of how, how does the, the systems usually react. And, and then we have some algorithms that are able to do uh, load and production forecasts uh, and basically using those uh, information sources we are estimating the, the state of different points in the, in the distribution grid. This is still early work in the project but, uh, but if it's something that you are also working on then maybe uh, keep an eye on uh, when we have deliverables coming out in the project and what are the results. Uh, Mostly this is the people from Joseph Stefan Institute in Slovenia that are working on this. <clears throat> then uh, in the forecasting uh, part of the project, so here we, we want to be able to forecast the short term, um, so be able to uh, have an idea of what is the production we need, uh, so taking into account uh, yeah, on one hand, uh, historical load variables, but also seasonal variables, so yearly, weekly, daily, and uh, meteorological data, so will it be cloudy, will it, uh, how many hours of sun is expected uh, on, a, on a given day. And then, of course, if we have uh, holidays, and uh, yeah, then that is important to know. Um, and great. Topology is, is also important, but I, I think the people that work with this also mentioned they they actually try to analyze also Twitter feeds and stuff like that to see if there are some yeah, contextual events that could influence what is happening. Um, yeah, the tools they are using one is this. I think they actually have developed this themselves as Q minor and then they are using some different uh, computer intelligence uh, approaches. And to begin with they have analyzed uh, 20 industrial smart meters from Electro Primorska, so the DSO in the project. Now this is again all very small, um, but this curve over, over here, the yearly trend, um, so basically this is, uh, all, all these plots are input data, so we have some yearly trend, uh, so here is one year, another year, and then a third year, so you can see there's somehow the same uh, overall shape of these, these curves. Um, here we have weekly trends, so it's the same pattern as we saw on the, on the previous slide. Um, and yeah, here's some. So we have the daily trend. It's, uh, here we have winter, a day in the winter, so what is uh, consumption? 
so here the consumption is uh, on, on weekdays, the curves up here, and the weekend is down here. The, the weekdays naturally has a higher consumption than in the summer, where heating uh, is not as necessary. Um, and this is also shown over here, a different uh, correlation uh, diagram. So we have the days of the week and the months of the year. This is a, a heat map of the load and a heat map of the temperature. Um, yeah, it's, unfortunately, it's too small to, to really see. Um, but what we can see is that in <coughs> January, and February, November and December we have a, a large load on the normal weekdays. Um, and of course this is also when we have the winter, so it's, it, it's just a different representation, a different way of analyzing the data. Um, the idea is then to use this kind of uh, feature matrix or feature vector, I think they call it. So, so they're encoding um, if, if some phenomenon happens in a specific month, a specific day of the week or a specific hour of the day, then they, they input that to the machine learning algorithms in, in that way. So, uh, yeah, so far there are not any real forecasting results uh, since this task, it, uh, it hasn't been running for a lot of months so far, so it's only the initial results. So actually this uh, more or less concludes my talk. I will give a short summary of what, uh, what I talked about. Um, so first we talked about uh, grid observability, how to, uh, how to provide that. We need to have uh, these WAMS nodes that can uh, measure the voltage and current phases in real time. Um, we found out that uh, WAMS nodes can be supported by LTE networks. Uh, yeah, also that the GPS can support smart meters for five minute report intervals. Um, but for the WAMS report size it would be nice to have some more compact format. So we don't stress the LTE network um, that much. Then we talked about running the grid closer to its limits. Uh, and what one of the things that is necessary is the ultra reliable communications. We have end-to-end uh, -end security via this embedded SIM approach. And then in some sense we also investigate these novel state estimation and forecasting algorithms. Um, so, so that we get true full observability in the grid. Um, yes, that was all from my side.